Hello, everybody. Jim Rutherford here with Self-Reliant Leadership. Glad you're with us today. And um, we had a few technical difficulties with StreamYard, so hopefully everybody's going to be able to find us today. I'm super excited to um, bring in our guest, who is uh, Dave Crenshaw, who, if you are on LinkedIn, um, I am positive you know exactly who Dave Crenshaw is, and, and here he is. Hey, Dave, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm not hearing you. Hey, Jan, Jan how you doing? There we go. Good, good. Um, so five books, tens of millions of people have watched you on, on LinkedIn Live. You've been at this since LinkedIn 98, learning. Yeah. a long time. And my main question, having met you now for the first time, because I read your book when I was a CEO, um, The Focused Business, it really helped me. But my main question is the best. The vest, the brand. Oh, the vest. Always, what about the you vest? You always have a vest on. What's the story with the vest? <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where I, I did it a couple of times for speaking events and people are like, oh, I really like that. And then I just kept doing it. And then it almost became sort of like a, a thing that people expected. And that actually happens sometimes. I'll post on, on LinkedIn and I'm not wearing the vest. And people say, what's going on? Why aren't you wearing the vest? So I'm not going to say I'm at the same level of Bob Ross. I'm certainly not. But it's kind of like Bob <laughs> Ross, where in his later years, he hated the, the the big hair, but everybody expected him to do it. So he just never got rid of it. And so I'm I'm wearing vests all the time now. Yeah, there. And, 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 and I've got a, a really good friend um, out there that wears a vest all the time. And I told him, you can't button the bottom button. Um, and, and do you know why? And I don't know the origin of that. Do you know why you can't, I, you're not supposed to? I do, to actually. Because when you're wearing vest, you have to check that out. You're like, what is it? And uh, it goes all the way back, I believe, to King George. And uh, King George was uh, one of the King Georges. It was uh, a little more overweight. So he couldn't have the bottom button buttoned. So he unbuttoned it. And then everybody else, of course, wants to look like the king. So yeah. everybody else did that. And then that became the standard uh, in terms of fashion for vests. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad to know that. Um, yep. I always because I had to tell my friend, you're, you're doing it all wrong. You can't button the bottom button. And I don't know how I know that because I don't know anything about fashion. But um, you always look sharp. And um, as I mentioned, you know, I read your book, The Focus Business, How mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs Can Triumph Over Chaos. Um, and when I was a CEO, I was in a turnaround situation and that that book really helped me. And I was actually surprised to learn when I, I looked you up. I'm like, who is this guy that's so wise and has all this wisdom? And I was surprised that you were so young. I'm like, <laughs> how did you how did you figure all this out at such a young age? And here I was a crusty older CEO, thought I knew everything. And that CEO job just absolutely kicked my butt. And and you, you know, that that book really helped me because I had all these people around that were contributing to the chaos. And, and I had to realize it was all within my control. Yeah. Where, where, well, did, that, where did you, where did you figure that out so early on? Well, first of all, it makes my day to hear that the book helped you. And uh, the second thing is I am not as, uh, as young as I look, I'm actually 82, <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, I, I'm I'm 46. I've always had a little bit of a baby face, but I started uh, almost so half my life ago is when I started working with business owners. So that was 23. Yeah. I was young enough, foolish enough to think that I could help uh, entrepreneurs succeed. And so what happened was before I even graduated from college, I was going through entrepreneurship at the Marriott School of Management, and I I went out and I started coaching business owners. So when you coach. Uh, entrepreneurs over and over and over, you start to see patterns of behavior. You start to see patterns of what, what happens. And everyone says, well, my business is different. Every single entrepreneur says that my business is different because, yeah. and then you fill in the blank. But in reality, they're all the same in a lot of key areas. So the focus business was based on years and years of coaching entrepreneurs and seeing those patterns of behavior. And so, as you know, in the book, I created the seven super villains because uh, yeah. I'm a geek. I'm, I love yeah. superheroes. I love comic books, all that kind of stuff. And so I created uh, the seven supervillains that represent seven very real things that entrepreneurs experience every single day in their business. For example, uh, you know, the, uh, the con, which is that belief yeah. that 
Uh, in the end, all of this will be worth it. When I cash out my business, that's when all this will be worth it. When in fact, we need to make it worth it now. We need to have those little uh, oases in our, in our day and our week that help us succeed. So that's just one of, of the seven. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. the con, um, the jack of all trades, the bear, the Ms. Opportunity, the siphon, overlord. Um, you know, and it's interesting, um, before we went on live, we were talking a little bit about um, what we're both experiencing with our clients as executive coaches and consultants and, and all that. And I'm wondering, you know, what what you're hearing and it, to see if it kind of matches up to what I'm hearing as, as you know, the, the major challenges that people are experiencing right now. What are you seeing? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I feel like at least when I'm working, so, I, you know, I work with both business owners and, and executives in, in more of the traditional Fortune 500 or, or you know, uh, upper management sort of thing. For entrepreneurs, I, I see them still optimistic. I mean, that's the beauty of being an entrepreneur is uh, challenge is opportunity and opportunity mm -hmm. is growth. So when there are challenges, when there are things that are difficult, they're figuring out how to make the most of it because they have that mindset. And in a way that sort of answers the question, because when I'm working with someone who's in a Fortune 500 company, that kind of thing, they don't have that mindset quite as much. So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do is inject a little entrepreneurial perspective so that when they see things, for instance, like uh, the, the obstacle of people don't want to come into work all the time. Right. Um, and and their tendency is to push back against that, to try and force a different outcome when instead it's an opportunity for the business to evolve. It's an opportunity for their practices and their systems that they follow to become better and stronger. It, it's you know, there are some businesses that are getting it. And what they're doing is they're using this as a recruiting opportunity because businesses right now are struggling to find great people. Right. I, I find that in general, at least in the United States, the, the economy bounced back pretty quickly from, from the great lockdown. So what they're dealing with now is the same thing they were dealing with before. Where do I hire people? Where do I get mm -hmm. these people? So businesses and, and leaders that are, are forward thinking and saying, we're going to use working from home or hybrid work as a perk, that, that makes it more attractive to people. Mm -hmm. And you contrast that with, uh, oh gosh, what was the company we just saw in the news? Uh, it was Google, right? Mm -hmm. And they said, we're going to we're going to give you a pay cut if you work from home, if you work <laughs> from a place where the cost of living is lower. Now, maybe Google can get away with that, but that's an opportunity for everyone else to say, we're not going to do that. And yep. that's why you would rather work with us rather than even working for a wonderful place like Google. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm seeing similar thing. I mean, it, it's about talent, uh, you know, attracting great talent and retaining it. Um, and, and, you know, the employees are in the driver's seat right now. And, you know, what's interesting is whether I have a clients that are 30 years old or 60 years old, all the leaders that I see really, really, really want people back in the office. They really want people there. And, you know, I've challenged him and said, you know, why, you know, why do you, well, because, you know, we're better when we're together. That's mm -hmm. the standard answer you hear that we're going to collaborate. And I'm like, your, your people are sick of meetings. Your meetings are status updates. They're not collaborative. If you want people to want to be back at work, you've got to, you've got to change the way that you work at work. And, and again, if you want them to be collaborative, do collaborative things. Um, versus a cube farm with everybody with their headphones on and, and sitting there going, why am I here and, and not at home? So yeah. I'm, I'm seeing the, the, the same thing. And I think, you know, part of it is people are really starting to, and this is what I wanted to ask you about really, is I think people are really struggling with defining what success is, whether it's a leader or an employee, an individual contributor. I think people are having this existential crisis trying to figure out, well, what do I want? What's success look like? Um, are you seeing that across the yeah. board? Oh, absolutely. I've seen a lot of people who are reevaluating their lives, reevaluating their career choices. What is it that I really want out of it? And, and I, think, I think there are 
are two sides to the question in terms of what is success. The, the first part to me, my definition of it is the ability to live the kind of life you want to live. And yeah. the reason why I like that definition is it it's adaptable to anyone. Some people want to be always on the road. Like, like Jan, before this call, you were talking about how you like to always be up on the mountains and you're hiking yeah. and you're doing these things. And that's wonderful. I admire that and wish that that was part of me a little bit more maybe. Mm -hmm. But for me, living the kind of life that I want is a little quieter. I, I and a little more, I don't know. I, I, I like to relax. I like to play video games. I like to hang out with my kids and play pool in the basement. That's the kind of life that I want to live. And it, the, a moment like this causes people to really evaluate what is it do I want most? And the other aspect of it, and I hint on this in, in, uh, in the Focus Business and also in my book, The Power of Having Fun, which is this is not a future destination. Right. Everyone thinks that I will have the kind of life that I want to live when I retire, mm -hmm. when I cash out my stock shares, when my business is sold, whatever the reason is. And the reality is all of that is it's you're thinking in the future. It's the I, I call it the culture of wish. It's worth it someday, hopefully. Someday mm. all this is going to pay off. And yeah. what I encourage people to do, and, and by the way, I'm not in always an acronym mode, but I like this one, is to yeah. think in terms of the culture of win, which is worth it now. That everything that you're doing is worth it now. That you can live, at least to a large degree, some of the things that you want to have now, not just in a future de uh, destination. And you can do that in a responsible way. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of time. It's just being conscious and making sure that those things happen. And those things can happen whether we're working together in person or whether we're working from a home office. Yeah. You, you remind me, um, I, when I met Marshall Goldsmith for the first time, I remember he walked in this room. There's only about a dozen of us. And he said, um, first he said, I only have 15 minutes of material. You know, he's very self-deprecating. And he said, but I can tell you this, I can read all of your minds. I know, I know what you all are thinking. In three weeks, you're going to be caught up. <laughs> and everything's going to be better in three weeks. And as we know, we're, you know, we're not going to be caught up in three weeks um, to inbox zero. Y your book, um, The Myth of Multitasking, um, Doing It All Gets Nothing Done. Are you <laughs> finding yourself reminding people that more and more that part of it is you've you know is it, multitasking is a myth, but part of it is you, you've got to start saying no to a whole bunch of stuff to be yeah. you know to get back to you know focus business focus self. Are you finding that? Oh yeah. Well, first of all, when you start to understand the cost of multitasking, you realize that most everything you're doing is taking 25% longer than it needs to. Mm. Uh, the average person, when they go through, for instance, time management fundamentals on LinkedIn learning, the average person is going to regain an entire work week's worth of time every single month. And that's just due to reducing how much multitasking is taking place in their day and in their week. And, um, and so when you talk about that idea of, you know, you're going to be caught up in a few weeks, well, the reality is, I operate and people who have successfully gone through my program operate as they are caught up continually within one week. There's nothing that I feel that I am behind on. There's no nagging voice in the back of my head saying, you know, while you're having this conversation with Jan, oh, I forgot to do whatever it is. I don't even try to remember what it is because it's on, on the schedule. And you, when you start to adopt that kind of mindset, you have control over your day and over your week. And you feel that you can accomplish far more with, with much less, less, less effort. There was another part to your question that I forgot. What was that? Well, it, it, I mean, it's about saying no. Oh yeah. And that's another thing. And I've thought about that a lot recently because I I've, I've been teaching for a long time. The myth of multitasking came out in 2008. Mm -hmm. And as you know, Jan, the best way to learn something is to teach it, right? Yeah. You teach it and it becomes more and more a part of who you are. And so I started doing a better job of saying no, you know, 13 years ago. And I've been doing it, I've been teaching in courses, but it, just in the last year, yeah. I've realized, you know what? I can say no even more than I have in the past. There's always an opportunity to say no more often. 
And the more, when you say no, more than you say yes. When you say no to the less valuable things and, and yes, more often to the highest value things, that just naturally sets you up for success and it reduces stress and it helps you create better quality work. Yeah, and, and you said something key um, is the things that are high value. Um, and I think that's the part that, um, you know, people get confused about is, you know, what do I truly value and in what priority? And, and most people will say, well, my family's at the top. And I'll say, okay, with regard to family, you've got time and money. You know, <laughs> you, you've got to make a certain amount of money to take care of your family, but you want to spend time. So how, how, does, how does that reconcile? And then go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, so I am very much a family guy. I've got three kids from age eight to 16. And, and I have a wonderful woman that I've been married to for 20 years. And I want to be married to her for another, you know, 50. I want, I, I want to be married to her for the rest of my life. And, and with that as the backdrop, I do not prioritize in terms of, um, I, I prioritize in a way that sounds pretty ruthless. I prioritize in terms of money, in terms of value, in terms of uh, what is going to make me the most per hour. And a lot of people think about uh, time and money backwards. They are so people are so focused on the idea that I'm going to be a salaried person and I'm going to focus on how much I make per year. When in fact, what you make per year, it doesn't matter. What matters more is what you make per hour. And here's what I mean. If you work, if, if you meet someone and let's say they made a great income, we'll just throw a number out like $100,000 a year. That's, that's pretty good, right? And that person says, yeah, I have to work uh, 70 hours a week to make this income. And then you meet somebody else who makes $100,000 a year and they say, yeah, I work 20 hours a week to make that income. Who is, who is experiencing the greatest amount of success? success? Who has the greatest amount of flexibility? So when you start to prioritize in terms of what is worth the most per hour, that is what sets up that definition of success. Because if you can really leverage each hour that you spend that way, then you have more free time. Then yeah. you have the ability to spend more time with family. Yeah. So everything that I've done, while it's been driven or motivated to be able to spend more time with family and to enjoy the life I live, it's always come back to the mechanism of how do I make more per hour? Yeah. Well, and, and you, what I picked up on a value you just described that's important for you is flexibility. I mean, that's what it boils down to is, and, and I would even translate that into the word freedom um, to do what you'd like to do when you'd like to do it. Um, yeah. and, and again, you know, that's the beauty of entrepreneurship versus, you know, um, if, if you were a salary per se. Although I believe that it can be done by people who are not entrepreneurs. I, I, I believe that, that many people in any position uh, have a greater ability to do this kind of thing than they believe they have. Mm -hmm. And it begins with assessing what are the, you know, I talk a lot in my courses about the most valuable activities. Every person has the top two most valuable activities they do, meaning the two mm -hmm. things that are worth the most per hour, that people pay the most per hour, or if you could hire someone that would cost you the most per hour to replace. And what you want to do is look at everything you're doing and say, how do I get rid of everything else? Mm. How do I get all these other things off my plate? And that's something that cannot be done overnight. Uh, I didn't do it overnight. I'm, I think I'm there at that spot where I'm really focusing on two things, which for me is creating content and delivering content. Yeah. And I, when I have brought people on my team, I say, your job is to keep me in those two things. If I'm doing something else, we're not doing it right. But I think anyone in a position can say, all right, I'm going to outsource parts of the things that I'm doing. I'm going to do a better job of delegating. Boy, that's a big problem, right? The yeah. inability of people to let someone else do their job <laughs> for them because uh, uh, people are so addicted to the idea of uh, I have to do it all myself. So there are lots of opportunities, I believe, Certainly entrepreneurs, it's easier, but I believe there are lots of opportunities for anyone in any position. Yeah. Let me um, pop a question up here that came in. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if, um, what major qualities are required for working as a fresher? I'm not sure what fresher. <laughs> um, well, 
you know, I, I think if I'm just going to go off the question of what major qualities are required for any position, that really does take time to, you know, you have to look at the position description and really think about it. A lot of times people just get a job and then they, they, they get the job because of what the description was. And then they're stuck in that job just thinking, oh, I got it. I got it. But what we really want to do is continually be improving. That's one of the wonderful things about LinkedIn Learning. You've got your excellent courses on there. You should yeah. always be trying to improve the qualities rather than just getting your job and expecting that that's enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well, um, again, I want to remind the audience of the, the books you've got out there. The Myth of Multitasking. Invaluable, The Secret to Becoming Irreplaceable, The Power of Having Fun, How Meaningful Breaks Help You Get More Done, The Result, The Proven Practical Formula for Getting What You Want, and then the one I mentioned at the beginning, The Focus Business, How Entrepreneurs Can Triumph Over Chaos. So those are five and counting. Are, are you working on another one already? Oh, I, I'm at the point now where I'm actively saying no to myself <laughs> about the idea of doing another book. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, part of it has to do with the most valuable activity concept. Mm -hmm. I have found that I can reach far more people and have a greater impact with a course on LinkedIn learning than mm -hmm. I can with a written book, because a, a book is what's the way you're just you're sitting, you're, you're sitting and you're not doing anything versus a course like time management fundamentals on LinkedIn learning. I can say, get up out of your chair and go do this and then come back and watch the next video. So I, I like online learning because it creates that exchange. There's a little more back and forth with it. Yeah. And even LinkedIn learning has the Q and a feature. And I tried to be really conscious about that and respond to every question each week. And now I'm having a dialogue in a way that a book doesn't have it. So the books are great. They helped me, you know, put my thinking down on paper and make it real. But uh, right now I focus more and more on online courses. Yeah. Well, I, you know, as I look at your, your books um, and I break it down, you know, you, you really cover these hot, these big five topics, time, you know, where we spend our time, the, the ultimate thing we control um, results, you know, and, you know, performance that, um, you know, no matter what we are serving other people, if we're yeah. working, um, fun, you know, how, however that's defined, we, we've talked about values and then we talked about focus. I mean, I think you've got a lot of that. And, and when you, um, I looked at your values for your organization, um, and, and they're, they're kind of, um, I mean, they're a great mantra. It's give first, be invaluable, live a balanced life, be humble, embrace entrepreneurship, build simple systems, have fun, be a go-getter. I mean, those those characteristics are really typified in, in all the books you've written. Mm. I mean, don't you think? Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. Are you saying that? Um, I think my goal is to, to be consistent uh, in, in the values that I live in the principles that I live. I, I think that there's always room to evolve and learn new, new things and new perspectives, but I believe that principles and values can be timeless. And I tried to choose things that were that were that really spoke to me. And part of the hiring process is using those values. So when I would bring someone onto my team, I'm assessing them in terms of those values first. So before we get into what can you do, which is where yeah. most people start with the interviewing process, I'm starting with who are you? Yeah. And if, it, for instance, like the last one you mentioned, being a go getter. If this is someone that I'm going to have to teach them how to be a go-getter, this is not the place. This yeah. is not going to work out for them. I want somebody who's already demonstrated through the hiring process, through the way in which they answer the questions, through the, through the notes that they send after the interview, that they are a go-getter, that they're, they're pursuing it. And these are things that any, any company can do. You can create those values and assess them in terms of the values first yeah. before you start getting into what skills do you have. Yeah, I totally agree. And and the go-getter, the drive, I, I've always said, boy, that's not something you can develop in other people. You, you there's know. there's an old story called that. Have you ever run across that? No. So yeah. there's a mentor of mine um, who, who introduced me to it. And it's the story of the blue vase. It's old. I think it's like 1927, something like that. 
but it's it's such a great little story that illustrates the principle. In some ways, it's you know it, it is it's got some dated things to it, but basically the idea is a, 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 a guy gives a person a task to get a blue vase, and he knows that the store is closed. He knows that they're not going to have any access. What is he going to do? H how is he going to follow through? Does he give up, or does he keep trying to find a way to get to it? And um, that's always stuck with me. And that's the kind of person that I want to have working with me. So when something, when they experience an obstacle, they don't say, I can't do this. And come to me and say, what am I supposed to do? But they instead say, this is really challenging. Here's what I think I should do. Uh, should I go for it? Right? right. And then that way, I'm not a human vending machine answering all their problems. I can be a coach helping them achieve what it is that they're, they want to do. No. Yeah. That's great advice. I mean, so many of us, when we get to leadership positions, love the fact that people are coming to us asking for advice and things. And, and then we, you know, we become a bottleneck. Yeah. Um, so let me get to some um, audience questions here. Um, yeah. the, the first one from, um, let me see if I can say an Ajayi. How do you sell yourself when you prefer to help others shine? Oh, I love it. I, I'd love to get your take on that, Jan, too. But uh, yeah. to me, that is the definition of a leader. Uh, that is the definition of a manager. Your job is to help other people be their best and to succeed. I view leadership as the role of creating other leaders. So if that's your trait, Ajayi, I think I'm, I'm I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, you're, you're, you're already set up as a leader. So what I would do is I would talk about how you're a coach how you work on coaching. I would study coaching and how you can help others grow and achieve. Because if you think about it, um, um, sometimes people think that managing is doing things for other people, which leads to micromanaging, which is probably the least effective way that you can lead yeah. others. So if you can say, look, I want to help others succeed. I spend my time training others. I spend my time learning how I can train others. That is a great trait for a variety of manage management leadership positions. So I see that. Yeah. I don't see those two as opposites. I see those as, as greatly connected to each other. Yeah. No, I agree, Dave. And I, I think when you are selling your team and helping others shine, you're you're selling yourself. I mean, yeah. to me, there's nothing more attractive than than a leader that has the humility to let their team shine. So great yes. question. Um, let me go to. Um, let me go. Let me see if. Um, Gregors, I don't know if I'm saying it right. Um, how do you convince others to give up multitasking in a company? How do you change the company culture in this regard? That's, that's a good question. Big one, a big question. Well, if only there was a book that was written to help convince <laughs> people that multitasking is bad, if you could find that. No, I mean, that really is the reason why I wrote The Myth of Multitasking. I was writing it from the perspective of trying to convince the unconvinced. So that's a great tool. But but here's here's something that's really easy for you. Um, if you go to DaveCrenshaw.com forward slash exercise, uh, DaveCrenshaw.com forward slash exercise, there is a video uh, that, that walks people through what I call the myth of multitasking exercise. And it illustrates very, very quickly in just you know, a matter of four to five minutes what multitasking is actually costing people. I do it in all my live presentations. It's in time management fundamentals on LinkedIn Learning. And that opens people's eyes up very quickly. And it was created for that purpose because I, I could get up and I could talk about what multitasking is costing us and how bad it is and all these different things. That's not going to convince you as much as doing it firsthand. It's a little exercise where everyone switch tasks. That's what I call multitasking. They switch tasks for a while. And at the end of it, they go, oh my gosh, now I see it. Now I get it. Does it convince everyone? No, but it probably convinces about 90% of the people who go through it. So if you had a team meeting, I would say, let pull that video up. And I even, I even have a PDF that you can print out and give to people, uh, or they can just write on a piece of paper and do that exercise. I guarantee you at the end of it, you will have a bunch of people on your side saying, yes, we need to make a change on this. Yeah, great. Let me go to um, another one here. Um, and again, we really appreciate all these questions coming in. Yeah. Um, this one, and boy, um, I, my, my, and I'm, I'm going to apologize because my name gets mispronounced a lot. But these, these names are, are um, challenging. Sumya, Sumya um, is my guess. 
Um, multitasking is often considered as a plus point with people citing it as a strength. How can one shift the org culture to, to do that deep focus? I guess it would, you're, you'd echo the answer you just provided. Yeah, I think I think that would help, but it, it highlights a problem that how often multitasking is listed on a job description as mm. something we expect people to do. And it gets to the core of what my book, The Myth of Multitasking, is about, which is there's confusion because the word itself is inaccurate. Multitasking does not actually take place. Uh, there are really, you know, if I were to break all of the different things that could happen into two major categories, it is either switch tasking or it's back tasking. Switch tasking is where you're trying to perform multiple attention requiring tasks. Like if I'm trying to do this interview with Jan and I'm checking my email while I'm doing it, right? That's, that's absurd. But yet we do that all day long. The other is back tasking. That's where something mindless, mundane, automatic is occurring in the background. For instance, if I was doing this interview with Jan while I delegated something to my assistant, which by the way, is happening right now, or while I set my printer printing out a large print job. Backtasking is productive. It is efficient. So if you're someone who's responsible for having a job description, I would use different words other than multitasking. If you're, Are you saying that you need someone to manage multiple projects at the same time? Then that's great. You know, I would say handling multiple projects at the same time. Or are you saying we want someone who can jump from task to task to task if that's what you're expecting, I'd rethink that job description because that's not that's not a productive way for a human being to operate. Yeah, and, and somebody weighed in here. Um, uh, she's um, task switching and refocusing back almost always incrementally takes two times the amount of time at the cost of focus and quality. Yep, so. and it adds stress. And it adds stress to the equation. Yeah. And, and who um, is not stressed out right now? Yeah. One of the best ways to reduce the stress that you have is to simply stop trying to do multiple things at the same time. And the multitasking exercise illustrates that really well. And, and here's a, um, from James saying, um, your course is great. I did it and was surprised. So, so Awesome, James. Thanks. Makes my day to hear that. Thank you. Um, let me go to this one. I heard that multitasking kills our productivity. Is that st statement true in real life? Yes, yes. It, it, and I tell a story, in fact, in my speeches that um, that illustrates this. Um, there was there was a time when I was watching a, a football game and my son came up and he said he wanted me to read the story in the middle of the game. And I, 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 I said there are th three options that went through my mind. Number one is I tell the kid to go away. But he was he was too he's too cute. I couldn't do that. Number two is I say, uh, I. You know, I say, OK, let's pause the game while I read it to my son. But I have friends over. I'm not going to do that. The third one is I focused on him. And when I focused on him, it it built the relationship and it made it stronger. And it only took just like a couple of minutes. And I don't know what I missed during that time where, where there was a sack of fumble or a funny beer commercial. And he was happy and then went off and did his thing. And you have moments like this all the time in your personal life where someone wants to talk to you. They want your attention. And if you go, okay, oh, really? Oh, that's great. Can you see how that impacts the relationship of, uh, with, with real people? So you want to make it a habit that if, if a person is talking to you, you put the device away. You step away from the computer screen. You do whatever you need to do to give them 100% of your attention. Yeah. And, and here's a question from my old friend, Dave Tabor, a uh, great guy in Denver. When someone's looking at their phone saying, don't worry, I'm listening, I say, I'll wait. Is there a better way to be empathetic? I, fact, I actually don't have much of a problem with that. Uh, what I like to do sometimes that is uh, requires, I just, just, just do nothing. <laughs> if you're talking <laughs> to someone and they start looking at their phone, I just stop. Yeah. And, and typically after, you know, 20, 30 seconds, they realize what's going on. And then they'll say something like, Oh, I, you know, you can keep talking and I'll, and I'll say, oh, well, what you're doing seems important. Yeah. And, and then I say, I'm, I'll, I'll be glad to wait. And what that does is it puts the, the other person in a position where they have to make a choice. And there's nothing wrong with that choice. They can either say, you know what, I do need to do this. I, I had that just with my wife last night. Right. I started talking to her. She was on her phone. and I just I just stopped. And I'm like, do you, do you need to focus on that for a little bit? And she said, yeah, yeah. So then I decided and I waited. And when she was done, then we could focus on each other. So 
I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Maybe just be quiet for a little bit. Maybe add a few other words to let them know. Yeah, that's fine. I, if this is important, I'll wait. I think that's yeah. great. Yeah, I do that with clients. I, I'll say, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I want to make sure I have your undivided attention. You know, our, both our times yeah. are valuable. You know, I'll, I'll politely. Um, here's one. I'm a woman, Brazilian living in Bogota, mother of two low ones in career transition. Um, by the way, my daughter-in-law is Brazilian. Um, to Dubai. Um, I have to study English to support my family's moment and planning my back to the work. How could I get equilibrium? Um, so that's a good question. And, and a yeah. common, any, any thoughts there, Dave? Well, first of all, I'm going to say, uh, uh, Christiane, I'm assuming that's right. Um, you know, my respect to you, <laughs> you're, you're really, you know, what a great, uh, mom, that you're trying to make this happen and you're doing all these things. So first of all, my respect and my admiration for you to, to do that. Um, you used a great word. You said, well, you know, I'm assuming you meant equi equilibrium, but I love equilibrium. That's great too. <laughs> um, I, I like to use the word rhythm. So sometimes people talk about work-life balance and, and I even have a course called, you know, balancing work and life because that's what people expect. But then I explain in it that I prefer the term rhythm. And if you think about what rhythm is, uh, you know, if you think about with music, right? There's a pace to it. There's a there's a tempo. There are times when we take a break, and and that's what makes the music beautiful. So if you think about your work day or your day at home, what you want to do is say, what is the correct rhythm? When do I need to have the greatest amount of focus? For instance, doing my studying, doing work. You want to schedule that during times when you are least likely to be interrupted by your two children. So that you do low value work, work that can be interrupted or even no work at all during the times when they're going to require the most need. So I've got kids. I know that one of the times they have the greatest amount of need is when they come home from school. So that's in the neighborhood around here in Utah. It's around 2 to 3.30, right? So that's a time where I need to make myself more available or we need to make ourselves more available to, to our kids to focus on them. So maybe you have a couple of start and stop times in your day. Maybe you take a break in the, the middle of the afternoon and then you start it back up in the evening when they're asleep. But here's the most important thing, that you do have a schedule. You don't want to allow yourself to get pushed around by what happens in the moment, but as much as possible, create a, a, a structure so that you can find that rhythm. And that takes some time. You know, try, set something up, try it for a couple of weeks, and then look at it and make a few adjustments and then try it for a couple more weeks. Yeah. Great question. Um, a couple observations here. Um, in the current pandemic, we're forced to manage multiple things. So is forced multitasking or constant switch tasking, which makes you makes you feel overwhelmed. Mm. I think that's an observation. Yeah. Um, the. Um, now, here's one, Dave, see if you agree or disagree. It can be for it can be performed well if we list the task with priority. You know, I've heard this I've heard this argument, and what I can tell you from my field experience working with people is multitasking is not occurring. There are only one of two things occurring. You are either switch tasking or you are back tasking. Switch tasking is requiring to change back and forth, and every time you switch, there is a switching cost to be paid. The goal should be to reduce as much switching cost as possible, because if you can reduce the switching cost, you can recover at least a work week's worth of time every single month. Some positions require switching, and that's fine, but we still can, uh, instead of just accepting it, we want to ask ourselves, how can we, we reduce the switches? How can we stay focused for longer periods of time? Because if you reduce switching cost, you reduce all of the costs involved, lost time, increased stress, more mistakes, increased stress levels, right? So, um, so I would try to avoid it and then instead ask the question, how can I back task? How can I have something occur in the background while I'm focusing on something else? The more you can back task, that is productive, that is efficient. But I, I'm al I always advocate that the word multitasking, we try to avoid using it because it's just confusing and, it, and it's not accurate. Yeah. And, and, and AJ just said, you know, do you recommend taking a nap at the office? And, and I'll answer that one and I'll say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend taking a break. 
Uh, small breaks. I recommend breaks of about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes every 90 minutes if possible. And there's a reason for that. It's called the ultradian rhythm. Uh, and it's discovered by the same guy who discovered the circadian ry rhythm, Nathaniel Kleitman. And what he found was that in the neighborhood of 90 minutes to every two hours, we need a break in order to perform at our top level. So whether that's a brief nap or whether that's going for a walk or playing video games or whatever it is, I recommend having those in the day because you'll actually be far more productive than you would be if you just plowed past that 90 minute to two hour mark. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, one more, one more question, Dave. Um, sure. And um, um, do you have like five examples of man, you know, <laughs> managing your time or maybe and how much time do I have to give those five examples? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you'll forgive me, I'll answer that question by sending you to the, the best resource possible, which is my course, Time Management Fundamentals on LinkedIn yeah. Learning. Uh, that you can get a quick link to that is davecrenshaw.com forward slash time. And if you have a premium LinkedIn Learning membership, it's already included in it. If you don't, there's like a way, there's a way to get a 30 day free trial and you can go through that whole course. In that course, if someone hires me to come into their office and work one on one with them, I will charge them a very, very large amount of money to do that for, because they're asking for my personal time. But time management fundamentals teaches the exact same thing that someone would pay me tens of thousands to teach to them one on one. And you can get it for, you know, for the membership cost or for free for 30 days or as part of your LinkedIn membership. And that will walk you through everything, top to bottom. It's a complete time management solution. And it'll, it'll solve most every problem that people have with time management. Yeah. Well, Dave, um, I mean, I love, I love the fact that you've got all these facts right at the top of your head <laughs> um, and, and that there's a passion there. To me, you know, if I'm kind of processing what we've talked about, you know, two big things kind of hit home again was drive and curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that we look at least, I think you and I both share that we, that's what we look for in other people. But I think the, one of the main messages, and I'll put all your books up in front of us for a second here. Oh, thank you. Um, is the fact that I think you're really talking about being intentional. I think that's a big part of this is intentionality. What, what do you say? Yeah. Slowing down. Being aware of what's what's occurring, the, and I think it's a nice place to wrap it up. One principle I talk about is the missing minute, and the missing minute is that gap between things that we lost, that someone stole from us somewhere along the way. You know I mean like listening to this, watching this, and then immediately going into our email. And if we can just stop, and it's almost different than mindfulness. It's just a sixty second gap where you do nothing. And you just let it sit for a little bit. And when you you become accustomed to moving from task to task to task to task, you're missing out on growth and opportunity. So, yeah, mm. what, I think we agree with that. And I, we agree with each other on that, that we need to slow down a little bit, be a little more intentional. And that actually will make us more productive and more successful. It's funny. You know, it's so funny you say that because when I lead expeditions with executives and military veterans in the mountains, the main takeaway is always, you have to slow down to speed up. And mm -hmm. we always say, you know, hey, you're gonna fly out on Sunday and, and trust me, you know, don't book anything on Monday. Use Monday to think and process what happened over the last four days out in the mountains. Mm. That's so smart. And, yeah, and, and the people that don't regret it you know, that jump right back into it, that they need that time to reflect. And um, so I think your, you know, your, 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 you know, your wit and wisdom is, is on track. And again, to everybody listening, um, Dave is the most popular instructor out on, on LinkedIn learning and um, tens of millions of people have benefited from that. Um, and, and again, unlike the book, you really get um, his personality really comes through and his passion and his energy. So I encourage you to Go out there and explore and and you know it's funny one of your values is to give first and you're you're probably the most prolific linkedin learning author that's always talking about other people's courses mm. and so you know you're living the you know the whole idea that it's not about you and to give 
And, um, you know, on behalf of all the other instructors that try to follow your lead, Dave, you know, thanks for being a great example for all of us and, and for all the work you do. It really makes a difference. Well, thank you. This was a lot of fun to talk with you, Jan. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, it, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. And, um, you know, and, and, uh, um, have enjoy the rest of your summer with your family and, um, keep living the good life. Will do. Thanks, Jan. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye everybody.